Chapter One of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. The Wandering Jew, Part One. Who that has looked on Gustave Doré's marvelous illustrations to this wild legend? can forget the impression they made upon his imagination. I do not refer to the first illustration as striking, where the Jewish shoemaker is refusing to suffer the cross-laden Saviour to rest a moment on his doorstep, and is receiving with scornful lip the judgment to wander restless till the second coming of that same Redeemer. But I refer rather to the second, which represents the Jew, after the lapse of ages, bowed beneath the burden of the curse, worn with unrelieved toil, wearied with ceaseless travelling, trudging onward in the last lights of evening, when a rayless night of unabating rain is creeping on, along a sloppy path between dripping bushes, and suddenly he comes over against a wayside crucifix, on which the white glare of departing daylight falls, to throw it into ghastly relief against the pitch-black rain-clouds. For a moment we see the working of the miserable shoemaker's mind. We feel that he is recalling the tragedy of the first Good Friday, and his head hangs heavier on his breast, as he recalls the part he had taken in that awful catastrophe. Or is that other illustration more remarkable, where the wanderer is amongst the Alps at the brink of a hideous chasm, and seeing in the contorted pine branches the ever-haunting scene of the Via Dolorosa, he is lured to cast himself into that black gulf in quest of rest, when an angel flashes out of the gloom with the sword of flame, turning every way, keeping him back from what would be to him a paradise indeed, the repose of death. Or that last scene, when the trumpet sounds and earth is shivering to its foundations, the fire is bubbling forth through the rents in its surface, and the dead are coming together flesh to flesh and bone to bone and muscle to muscle. Then the weary man sits down and casts off his shoes. Strange sights are around him, he sees them not. Strange sounds assail his ears, he hears but one, the trumpet note which gives the signal for him to stay his wanderings and rest his weary feet. I can linger over these noble woodcuts, and learn from them something new each time that I study them. They are picture poems full of latent depths of thought. And now let us to the history of this most thrilling of all medieval myths, if a myth. If a myth, I say, for who can say for certain that it is not true? Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom are our Lord's words, which I can hardly think apply to the destruction of Jerusalem, as commentators explain it to escape the difficulty. That some should live to see Jerusalem destroyed was not very surprising, and hardly needed the emphatic verily which Christ only used when speaking something of peculiarly solemn or mysterious import. Besides, St. Luke's account manifestly refers the coming in the kingdom to the judgment, for the saying sounds as follows, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. There can, I think, be no doubt in the mind of an unprejudiced person that the words of our Lord do imply that some one or more of those then living should not die till he came again. I do not mean to insist on the literal signification, but I plead that there is no improbability in our Lord's words being fulfilled to the letter, that the circumstances unrecorded in the Gospels is no evidence that it did not take place, for we are expressly told Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And again, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. We may remember also the mysterious witnesses 
who are to appear in the last eventful days of the world's history, and bear testimony to the gospel truth before the anti-Christian world. One of these has been often conjectured to be St. John the Evangelist, of whom Christ said to Peter, If I will that he will tarry till I come, what is that to thee? The historical evidence on which the tale rests is, however, too slender for us to admit for it more than the barest claim to be more than myth. The names and the circumstances connected with the Jew and his doom vary in every account, and the only point upon which all coincide is, that such an individual exists in an undying condition, wandering over the face of the earth, seeking rest and finding none. The earliest extant mention of the wandering Jew is to be found in the book of the Chronicles of the Abbey of St. Albans, which was copied and continued by Matthew Paris. He records that in the year 1228, quote, A certain archbishop of Armenia the Greater came on a pilgrimage to England to see the relics of the saints, and visit the sacred places in the kingdom, as he had done in others. He also produced letters of recommendation from His Holiness the Pope, to the religious and the prelates of the churches, in which they were enjoined to receive and entertain him with due reverence and honour. On his arrival he came to St. Albans, where he was received with all respect by the abbot and the monks, and at this place, being fatigued with his journey, he remained some days to rest himself and his followers, and a conversation took place between him and the inhabitants of the convent, by means of their interpreters, during which he made many inquiries relating to the religion and religious observances of this country, and told many strange things concerning the countries of the East. In the course of conversation he was asked whether he had ever seen or heard anything of Joseph, a man of whom there was much talk in the world, who, when our Lord suffered, was present and spoke to him, and who is still alive in evidence of the Christian faith in reply to which a knight in his retinue, who was his interpreter, replied, speaking in French, My lord well knows that man, and a little before he took his way to the western countries, the said Joseph ate at the table of my lord the archbishop of Armenia, and he has often seen and conversed with him. He was then asked about what had passed between Christ and the said Joseph, to which he replied, at the time of the Passion of Jesus Christ, he was seized by the Jews, and led into the Hall of Judgment before Pilate the governor, that he might be judged by him on the accusation of the Jews. And Pilate, finding no fault for which he might sentence him to death, said unto him, Take him and judge him according to your law. The shouts of the Jews, however, increasing, he at their request released unto them Barabbas, and delivered Jesus to them to be crucified. When, therefore, the Jews were dragging Jesus forth, and had reached the door, Cartaphilus, a porter of the hall in Pilate's service, as Jesus was going out of the door, impiously struck him on the back with his hand, and said in mockery, Go quicker, Jesus, go quicker, why do you loiter? And Jesus, looking back on him with a severe countenance, said to him, I am going, and you shall wait till I return. And according as our Lord said, this Cartaphilus is still awaiting his return. At the time of our Lord's suffering he was thirty years old, and when he attains the age of a hundred years, he always returns to the same age as he was when our Lord suffered. After Christ's death, when the Catholic faith gained ground, this Cartaphilus was baptized by Ananias, who also baptized the Apostle Paul, and was called Joseph. He dwells in one or other divisions of Armenia, and in divers eastern countries, passing his time amongst the bishops and other prelates of the church. He is a man of holy conversation and religious, a man of few words, and very circumspect in his behavior, for he does not speak at all unless when questioned by the bishops and religious and then he relates the events of olden times, and speaks of things which occurred at the suffering and resurrection of our Lord, and of the witnesses of the resurrection, namely, of those who rose with Christ, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto men. He also tells of the creed of the apostles, and of their separation and preaching, and all this he relates without smiling, or levity of conversation, 
as one who is well practised in sorrow and the fear of God, always looking forward with dread to the coming of Jesus Christ, lest at the last judgment he should find him in anger whom, when on his way to death, he had provoked to just vengeance. Numbers came to him from different parts of the world, enjoying his society and conversation, and to them, if they are men of authority, he explains all doubts on the matters on which he is questioned. He refuses all gifts that are offered him, being content with slight food and clothing. End quote. Much about the same date, Philip Musques, afterwards Bishop of Tournay, wrote his rhymed chronicle, 1242, which contains a similar account of the Jew, derived from the same Armenian prelate. Adun que ven tun aske ves que disame plan de buntek, pas et fe d'amenye. And this man having visited the shrine of Saint Tumas de Cantorbir, and then having paid his devotions at Monseigneur saint Jacques, he went on to Cologne to see the heads of the three kings. The version told in the Netherlands much resembled that related to St. Albans, only that the Jew, seeing the people dragging Christ to his death, exclaims, Attendez-moi, j'y vois, c'est mille fois prophète en quoi. Then, le voix du se regarda, et lui a dit que ni tarda, Isis ne te entardon pa, mais sa ses, tu m'attendra. We hear no more of the wandering Jew till the sixteenth century, when we hear first of him in a casual manner, as assisting a weaver, Crocote, at the royal palace in Bohemia, 1505, to find a treasure which had been secreted by the great grandfather of Crocote, sixty years before, at which time the Jew was present. He then had the appearance of being a man of seventy years. Curiously enough, we next hear of him in the East, where he is confounded with the prophet Elijah. Early in the century, he appeared to Fadila under peculiar circumstances. After the Arabs had captured the city of Elvin, Fadila, at the head of three hundred horsemen, pitched his tents late in the evening between two mountains. Fadila, having begun his evening prayer with a loud voice, heard the words Allah Akbar, God is great, repeated distinctly, and each word of his prayer was followed in a similar manner. Fadila, not believing this to be the result of an echo, was much astonished, and cried out, O thou, whether thou art of the angel ranks, or whether thou art of some other order of spirits, it is well, the power of God be with thee, but if thou art a man, then let mine eyes light upon thee, that I may rejoice in thy presence and society. Scarcely had he spoken these words, before an aged man, with bald head, stood before him, holding a staff in his hand, and much resembling a dervish in appearance. After having courteously saluted him, Fadila asked the old man who he was. Thereupon the stranger answered, Basi Hadret Isa, I am here by command of the Lord Jesus, who has left me in this world, that I may live therein until he comes a second time to earth. I wait for this Lord, who is the fountain of happiness, and in obedience to his command I dwell behind yon mountain. When Fadila heard these words, he asked when the Lord Jesus would appear, and the old man replied that his appearing would be at the end of the world, at the last judgment but this only increased Fadila's curiosity, so that he inquired the signs of the approach of the end of all things, whereupon Zerib bar Elia gave him an account of general, social, and moral dissolution, which would be the climax of the world's history. End of section 1